Hi, Victoria. I'm really Hi. happy to have you here. I'm very, very glad to be here. I will introduce you first and then we'll dive straight in. So this, everybody, is Victoria mm -hmm. Marsik. Am I pronouncing that right? Like Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She is a professor of adult education, no, adult learning mm -hmm. and leadership at Columbia University. And you're also directing programs there in adult learning and leadership. Mm -hmm. You hold a PhD in adult education uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. And work-wise, you have a wide variety of wide, you know, a lot of experience working with a wide variety of organizations in multiple countries, designing the, and developing and implementing um, informal learning and leadership interventions. And that's also where your research focuses, right? On informal learning, yes. incidental learning, action learning, and organizational learning. So mm -hmm. things like systems, uh, that system dynamics, learning organizations, and learning culture. Is there anything I've missed because your bio is super extensive and you've done like you've published like so much work. I just uh, ran like a, a Google Scholar. And, like <laughs> I had like over 3,000 3, hits. <laughs> so you've published a lot of work. So I'm sure I haven't done like your expertise that justice. Uh, no, have that's... I left anything out that you would like to add? No, th those are the things that are that keep me busy. <laughs> Yearly, yes. So what we're doing here, right, we're going to, uh, what we think is really important is that as learning professionals, learning uh, and development professionals, we work in an, what we call evidence-informed or research-aligned manner uh, so that we're aware of the research out there. And we feel we need to get better at standing mm -hmm. on the shoulders of giants <laughs> and have identified you as one of the giants. <laughs> So I would like to ask you the question, what is the one area of research that you think that people in L&D should know about? Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I love to talk about this and uh, I'm going to talk about action learning conversations, which I think is an important area for us to pay attention to in learning and development. And I'll start with a little bit about what it is and why it's important. Um, uh, action learning conversation is, is really a structured protocol. It, it has a structure in it that takes you step by step and each step builds on the prior step. Uh, and they help the learner peel back the different layers of their thinking about a problem or a situation. They are used when facing problems that do not have expert solutions, that do not have easy answers. They're often problems that are somewhat complex and systemic. They bring a, they involve a lot of stakeholders. There's a certain amount of unpredictability, which of course in our lives these days is great. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it is a problem that keeps coming back often. You know, you, you kind of whack at it and you try to solve it in one way and it works for a bit and then it comes back in another form. Um, or it could be that you faced it before, but not in these kinds of circumstances. So it's the context and the situation that makes it really challenging. Um, an example I love to use from some research on paramedics, uh, people who work in pairs and who go out to accident sites and places where people need emergency medical help. And they, they described this situation where they came upon an accident where there was a car hanging over a bridge and there was a truck on top of the car. So you can imagine the challenge of this situation, right? Because it was their job to save the lives of the people who were in the car, in the truck, and to not have it topple all over itself and, and do something worse. So uh, they did solve this in a safe way. And their description of how they did it in a paired conversation is not dissimilar from the kinds of tools we use in action learning. So I think there are some real live examples out there in the workplace where we do these things, we just don't do them that consciously. And in action learning conversations, we try to bring them together in a structured way that will help you go deeper. Uh, action learning is what it's based on and that is a leadership development strategy where people work on uh, real actual problems but they use it kind of as a learning laboratory so it's not only the solution of the problem we do that all the time in our various teams but we also step back and look at our process and look at our own learning and uh, look at whether we're getting to the right solution or we're ignoring important things etc and so um 
that becomes the base. And although these programs often uh, last for a period over time, we realize that the, the, the tools that they use can be used in more of a spot-like uh, kind of uh, format in, in the workplace when you hit a problem and you need some help from other people, from your peers. We all know that peer learning is where we get most of our support. Uh, we go to other people to just be sounding boards and to think things through. And this adds a bit of structure that kind of really kind of helps you to go deeper uh, in, yeah. into the problem. I think that structure is super appealing. <laughs> yeah. It is because things are messy, right? Exactly. <laughs> and and yeah. you at least can rely on on doing this. And because it is happening between you and peers, uh, if you want to vary the vary it a little bit, you know, it's okay. Uh, the important thing is to go through all the steps in some ways, whether you do it more in a formal way or an informal way, uh, because they they do build on one another. Um, so you know, why do this? Uh, it does really provide help uh, to think about realistic options when there are no clear expert solutions. And increasingly, that's a lot of our world, you know, so there are definitely situations where there are is expert knowledge available, there are protocols, there are things that we can rely upon. But we're often discovering new territory, either because the you know, for example, with artificial intelligence, there's just tons of new challenges with artificial intelligence that nobody ever envisioned before in quite that way. Uh, or it may be um, something that we uh, we have, as I said earlier, done before, but we've never done it in this situation or that situation. It's the situational factors that cause this to be a challenge. So uh, this helps us to get informed opinions uh, and informed experience of other people so that we can make better judgments and construct better trial and trial experiments <laughs> to see what works and fail fast. <laughs> Um, and it sounds like you're capturing it, right? Because that's another piece. Like there's a lot of talking in organizations and mm -hmm. meetings, but mm -hmm. not capturing what was tried. And yes, that I that is that true. Fun. And what we really learned from it, you know, oftentimes we have to perform on that, right? <laughs> when people ask us what we've learned, we 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 know we have an audience, and we have to say what the good things are, but right. we hold back the things that our fears, our doubts, uh, what we saw that we didn't want to report, you know, et cetera, and we have to put a good face on it. So, I'm going to walk you through this process, and I uh, I want to just note that um, in action learning, the really the key driver is questioning insight. So Reg Revens had a formula. He said learning does involve programmed wisdom or expert knowledge from the past, but we also have to question it and figure out, uh, you know, is this the right solution or how do we have to change it, et cetera. And so questioning really drives it and uh, it is open-ended questioning. And one of the things I think we often discover when we do this is that we, we're not as good at open-ended questions <laughs> as we are at, you know, leading questions and, you know, yeah, closed-ended questions yeah. and making yeah. assumptions, et cetera. So it feels a little awkward sometimes at first to, uh, to come up with questions. And in this process, one of the things we do is we take the advice seriously that you, you have to stop and reflect in order to sometimes think about these things. So you'll notice as we go through it, that it, at each step, we give the people who are the peers a moment to stop and think and to kind of identify and frame a question that they would like to ask. Because, you know, you might think, I want to ask a question about that. And you immediately th see, oh, my gosh, I'm really asking them if they tried out a solution I think they should try out. And that's yeah, not yeah, the purpose, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jump yeah. into the solution. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and we're going to use a framework that allows us to think about questions um, not only objective questions, which we're pretty good at, I think, in the businesses that we're in, um, uh, and decisional questions. We go to those things very quickly. But what we sometimes forget is that there are layers of interpretation uh, that happen between the, what we see and that, in fact, our interpretations often dictate to us what we see and what we do not see. So uh, we just don't see things we don't want to see that are not part of our frame of reference, right? Uh, so, uh, so these ref we we look at and we ask people to think about, you know, what's going on for them when they hear the question, the the memories, the experiences, the feelings that come up, which are often sources of questions 
that we may not feel we can quite ask because we don't know how to put them into words, but they are often the, the, the way in which we break kind of the frame that we've had and we say, oh my gosh, that's why I'm doing this. Oh my gosh, if I weren't, um, if, if it had, didn't have to do with the fact that this is an authority figure and I, I have this lingering memory of a very difficult experience with somebody, I would go right in and I would talk about it this way. So it's often by tapping into something about our own prior uh, feelings and interpretations that we break this. So I'm ready to uh, start the process and I'm going to give you an overview of what that looks like. And I have a diagram that might okay. help us to see what that looks yeah. like. Let's, let's do it. So I am going to share with you what this process looks like at kind of a high level, and then we will have an opportunity to walk through it and to try it out. And you will see that uh, this process has six steps and that it starts with really finding somebody who is willing to share a problem or a challenge or an opportunity. And that person kind of is the person who holds the challenge. And they're going to identify a question that they have, a problem that they have, and, and uh, put that into a question so that we have a question about it. Uh, and that's going to start the process. Uh, it will, we'll, we'll do this in, in 30 minutes uh, and we'll walk through this step. So uh, the, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about sharing the problem as a question as a starting point, and then I'll walk through each of these other steps. It's followed by some open-ended questioning, then there's a phase of assumption sharing, and that will lead us very much to being able to see whether that question needs some reframing. Uh, in other words, okay. the insights that we've gained may lead us to say, hey, I'm not really looking at the right problem. Let me ask it in a different way. Yeah, so that's step four. That's step four. And then step five is action planning and learning because there is no uh, good reflection unless it leads to informed action. And so we need to stop and ask ourselves what we next need to do in order to take this to the next level. And then some debrief on step right. six. Okay, so there's six steps and we're gonna start with sharing the problem as a question. That's correct. So um, the first step is to share the problem as a question. Um, and people sometimes do some prep for this. Uh, we have a prep sheet that you can look at just to kind of remind yourself of some factors of it. Uh, I have an example here that I'm going to use all the way through. And my example is was a real example from a facilitator at a workshop uh, who uh, had a team of people and in the community that they were working with, there was they got a grant to work with this community of women entrepreneurs and they wanted to use action learning in order to do this. But her team of facilitator didn't facilitators didn't actually know that much about action learning. They knew it, but they didn't have the skills so much in it. And so her question uh, had to do with how can I help my team get up to speed on the skills they need to facilitate action learning with these women entrepreneurs? Uh, so that's the first step. We have a clear uh, question for us to work on. And our second step is to use ORID to pose questions. So ORID is uh, different kinds of questions. I uh, mentioned in my earlier uh, section that uh, objective questions, the O part and D questions, decisional questions are easy for us. But in this phase, we're gonna focus especially on reflective questions and interpretive questions. So they're the kinds of things that are part of your meaning making that you would like to suggest uh, a question around because you would feel those would be important if you were in that situation. So uh, in this case, um, we will start by asking a few objective questions so just so you have a clearer idea of the context and the person can respond to, the, to these. That will only take about five minutes and we'll know enough to be able to ask then reflective and interpretive questions. So some of the objective questions that my group asked around this particular uh, question posed were things like, well, what specific training have they had in action learning? Mm -hmm. What do you value most about your team? How will the action learning facilitation be delivered in the pandemic? And okay. what's the biggest challenge that you think they have? So these are objective questions. She has a clear opinion about them. 
and she shared some of that information. We then moved to um, the reflective and interpretive questions. And starting from now and through the rest of this process, at each step, the person holding the problem is not going to reply when people pose their questions or pose their assumptions or whatever. They're going to just listen in as a curious person who was very, very interested in what these questions are and where they're coming from. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to give people a few minutes to just think about a question that you might ask, and then we'll take a few questions. Uh, and um, in this particular case, for this example, um, some of the open-ended questions that were asked were things like, well, what fears do you think those facilitators have? And hey, by the way, what's your worst fear about what might happen? <laughs> um, how much confidence do you have that you can train them? Mm. And another really good question was, what would they have to unlearn about the way they facilitate to support action learning facilitation? So those were some open-ended questions coming is there, from- Is there a difference between the interpretive questions and the reflective questions? There, there is a difference, but I feel that if you try to push the difference too hard, that people yes. get too self-conscious and they don't ask natural questions. So it's more about the open, open questions. It's the openness, it's coming from <clears throat> what you wouldn't necessarily ask in an O question or a D question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really being curious about certain things. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank I you. mean, the reflection questions often have to do more with emotions and feelings and what how things okay. land on you. Uh, the interpretive ones are the ones we use to make sense of things. Uh, okay. uh, different frameworks that you might use even at work that would have to do with um, how questions get interpreted around here. Uh, that that would be what that would be. Um, so. We are then going to go, so that is step two, the ORID questions. And uh, once uh, the problem holder has heard a number of these questions or read them from the chat, we're going to give that person a moment to stop and not answer any questions, but to kind of say, hey, you know, there were a couple questions in there that got me to think a little differently here or brought right. another point of view. And here were the ones that really kind of startled me. Here's, here's one and here's one. So just to reflect a little on the questions and how that affected their thinking, um, we would then go on to reflective, uh, we would then go on to assumptions. So in step three, three. Yep. we have the assumption identification. And you can do this in different ways, uh, but the way that I find most interesting for people is to hold what we call a fly on the wall conversation. And so it's as if uh, those of you who remember that now old movie, My Dinner with Andre, we were, we were sitting and watching Andre and someone else talk through the whole meal. Uh, in a way, the, the person who is the problem holder is going to be on the fly in the wall and they're going to just listen in to our conversation. So we are going to have a conversation about the assumptions. And the assumptions are things like, uh, I define it as, I think I'm right when I say, right? Because yeah. we, we often think we're right and we're really just assuming things. Yeah. Uh, and they may be assumptions that we hear that the problem holder has, but they may also be the assumptions we would have if we were in her shoes or his shoes. And so you can ask either kind of, uh, you can raise either kind of assumption and you can, it will be done in a sort of natural flowing conversation as if that person wasn't there. So we would be talking about the situation. Um, so here were some examples of some of the fly on the wall assumptions. Um, one of the one of the people said, well, if I were in her place, I would assume that they cannot learn action learning skills unless they go through an action learning experience themselves. You just mm -hmm. can't learn that kind of stuff by uh, by reading about it or even by doing practice skills. Um, another assumed they really do need to shift because in many situations, facilitation means directing and guiding towards some kind of an end. And in fact, in action learning, you really have to kind of empower the learners. Yeah. And so you have to sit with silences, you have to create a good climate, you have to do the kinds of things we often do in good non-directive coaching uh, to help them make right. decisions. So I'm, my, my assumption would be that. Uh, another, another person said, well, I think she might be upset if uh, something goes wrong and it upsets the collaborative relationship. She said she really values collaboration and you know what will happen if somebody gets upset because they're not they make a pro they make a mistake or they do something that is a little bit disruptive. 
So these were some of the things that we talked about. And then the problem holder came in and she reflected on what it is that she heard, but it also stimulated her to think about additional things. And she really just was completely surprised that she hadn't really thought about putting people through an action learning experience of some sort. And uh, she said, gee, I bet other people have done this. I wonder if I could find out what other people have done when they've trained people this way, because you can't really know it unless you've done it. Um, so those were some of the reflections that came out in the assumptions. And then in the uh, fifth fa phase, we are going to reframe the problem. That's step five is the okay, reframing. So is the, is the problem holder reframing it for themselves? Or is that it together? everybody else, everybody, we're going to do it together. Okay. And everybody is going to reframe it as they would reframe it if they were the problem holder. Okay. And the problem holder can also reframe it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we do need to remember what the original question was at this point, uh, because we have done a number of things. And at that point, uh, we may have forgotten what that is. And so uh, we repeat the original question. In this case, it was, how can I help my team get up to speed and skills they need to facilitate action learning? And uh, then we gave people a little bit of time to think about uh, how they would reframe that uh, problem. And we, we went around kind of in a round robin fashion, one person after another on the team. And the last person to talk was the problem holder. Um, okay. And so some of the reframes uh, that uh, occurred were, uh, well, actually there was one main one that kept coming up, which was how do I help facilitators on my team to reframe their mindset from being an expert facilitator to helping women take charge of their own learning? Uh, there seemed to be uh, the shift was from what should the training look like to get them the skills to, you know, how can I help them rethink their mindset? Because uh, it is a big shift when you're moving yeah, their from, own role as a facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. And and really it, it involves letting go and helping others and empowering others. And that is a uncomfortable in a lot of situations because you're expected to have certain kind of expertise and yes. you're looked to to make things happen. And in this case, you're asking people, well, what do you think? You know, what would you do if you were in this situation in my role, you know, et cetera. So um, so so that is the phase of reframing. And uh, the then there's a quite a bit of time to discuss from the point of view of the person who is holding the problem, what that what that person would reframe, how that person would reframe it. And so uh, the problem holder comes to decide on, gee, I think I'm gonna reframe it this way. I think this is where I need to go next. And the, and the final phase uh, of the process is one of action planning and learning where this generates a discussion about uh, many things. Uh, one is what is the next step I might need to take? Yeah. and. It, in this case, it was, I need to talk with my team uh, um, about how to be learning, how to, how to go through an action learning experience in order to learn it. But I also need to find out who else has done this. And I need to, I, several people in the room happen to have uh, suggestions because they've done that. Uh, I've done that too. And so we, we began to talk about, well, here are some things that you can consider, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we also um, then, at the end, this leads to a debrief that is really a debrief about the process from the point of view of the problem holder, but it's also about the other people on the team because what often happens is that we've been there in those shoes. And so what happens in our minds is as we go through this helping someone else is we make, a, we make connections to our own similar challenges. And so other things come up for other people. And so yeah. a rich debrief at the end around, you know, what are we walking away with is often very valuable, as well as, uh, you know, how did the process work for you? And what would what should we do differently the next time we do this? So that is the action learning conversation process. That's brilliant. And so is there any, because, uh, you know, this is a structured process, right? And, mm -hmm. and it ends in like um, some action ideas for the yes. problem holder. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate a little bit, um, you know, as the as kind of like the final summary on what the research research is telling you about why this process is so effective? 
Yes, I, I can do that. So particularly now with neuroscience research, uh, we know a lot about how the brain works and we know about the blind spots that we have in the brain uh, based on our cognitive biases, essentially. And so um, what, what, we have, what we can see is that by um, going through this process of kind of opening up uh, to new questions, it stimulates the creative side of the brain to make connections that it hasn't made before. Uh, and it also um, helps us to see things we would otherwise just completely miss. There, there is, for example, some neuroscience research that shows that um, when people are in situations where uh, they have to confront something that they have a bias against or that they have confusion about or uh, there are contradictions in the situation, but they don't see it, they only see it from one lens, that the, uh, the emotional side of the brain gets a reward for thinking in the wrong way. Uh, mm. for thinking about their own view and not taking like the it to easy consideration. way out the easy way out right we're reinforced to do that because the brain right. is also lazy you know wants the fastest answer well, yeah looking for a solution <laughs> exactly yeah yeah. yeah right so from a neuroscience point of view we see research that shows that um we have to step away from it and that um there's also a lot of research that's been done on the idea of perspective taking and what perspective taking can do. So uh, some colleagues in England, for example, who have done a lot of work with professionals who are kind of mid-career and a little bit burned out and who need to be refocused and re-stimulated in their work. And they work with critical incidents around uh, what it is that happened and, and what they what they did in the moment, but then they uh, use this idea of uh, asking uh, questions and looking at other perspectives. They have to put themselves in the shoes of the other people in the situation, and they have to describe what they would feel if they were in their shoes. And then they have to create a video or some creative product that uh, that captures the insights that they've gained from this sitting in the shoes of the other person. And so we know that the step of uh, opening up questions and, and getting the brain to think from different perspectives broadens us. It helps us to confront um, biases that have been holding back our being able to see the evidence. We talk about evidence-based learning, right? But there's lots of evidence out there. <laughs> and uh, research does show on informal learning, for example, that um, the, we often do not see uh, the unintended consequences of what we do right? Uh, because they're unintended and they're out of our radar screen. And so we only find those things that reinforce what it is we were looking for. And so um, this process uh, kind of seeks to broaden perspectives and to help people confront um, other points of view so that they can then ask themselves, why am I holding on to this? You know, why has this so been so important to me? You know, what is what is holding me back now from doing what could be the next step that needs to be done in this situation, but for some reason I'm fearful of it or I'm not skilled in it or, you know, I have amb ambiguity around taking that step. So uh, the, the research in different bodies, uh, neuroscience, um, develop, d adult development and developmental reasoning um, and uh, informal learning, social interaction, these are all areas where we find research that supports these steps. So it's clear to me that when I ask Victoria Marsic, like <laughs> what is the one area of research that people in learning and development should know, it is... Action learning conversations. <laughs> Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank great. you, it's been Thank a pleasure. You.